I am Charlie Revis. I serve as president of uh, Dysphonia International and uh, am pleased to be able to host this webinar today with a very special uh, guest speaker who I will introduce in a couple of seconds. Uh, the webinar is again just to uh, remind all of you is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel and listed on our website, which is dysphonia.org. And we encourage you to ask questions and you can submit your questions by typing them into the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. And again, let me emphasize that. Please put your questions in the Q&A box, not into the chat, because that'll make it easier for us to follow those. And we will answer as many questions as time will permit. But I want to assure you that all questions will be answered and they will become uh, available as part of the webinar uh, that we have listed on our website. <clears throat> I am uh, extremely pleased uh, to have the opportunity to introduce our uh, special guest speaker uh, for today's uh, webinar, Dr. Peek Wu. Dr. Wu obtained his medical degree from the School of Medicine at Boston University. He completed his internship at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center and did his own learnology residency at the combined uh, Boston University, Tufts University uh, training program. Uh, he also, uh, as his career advanced, served as vice chairman of own learnology at the Tufts New England Medical Center. And currently, uh, Dr. Wu is clinical professor in laryngology head and neck surgery at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Dr. Wu is an internationally recognized laryngologist, uh, clinical research scientist, and an author of the book's proboscopy, as well as numerous peer-reviewed articles uh, in the medical publications and journals. He has served as president of the American Laryngological Association, <clears throat> the American Bronco Esophological Association, the New York uh, Laryngological Society, and the New York Head and Neck Society. And he has also served as vice president of the Trilogical uh, uh, Society. And <clears throat> he has recently, uh, in the past, uh, received a uh, guest of honor recognition of outstanding contribution to the art and science of laryngology and the James Newcomb Award from the American Laryngological Association. Dr. Wu's career uh, has been focused on the development of laryngology as a subspecialty within the field of old laryngology. And he was very instrumental in development of the fellowship training program currently being used in laryngology. And he continues to train uh, old laryngology residents and laryngology fellows. Dr. Wu has been doctor to the New York State Theater and the New York City Opera. He currently serves as advisor to the New York Singing Teacher Association Professional Development Program and uh, his current private practice, uh, he limits to uh, laryngology, communication, and voice disorders. And we're also very proud to have Dr. Wu serve as uh, medical advisor for Dysphonia International. Dr. Wu. Well, thank you very much, Charlie, for that uh, incredible introduction. I just uh, wish my mother was here to hear that. <laughs> and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, see you again. Uh, even though it's virtual, and uh, I want to uh, express my um, gratitude to uh, you and the uh, um, Dysphonia International for this invitation. So um, I understand the audience, uh, you know, probably is uh, people who are interested in voice, and specifically, um, it may be neurolo neurological disorders of voice. So. Um, with that, I, I picked this topic to share with you, and um, I'm going to share my screen. So the uh, topic that I've uh, chosen 
uh, is uh, called the Diagnosis Management of Vocal Fulparesis. And I added a little something called presbyphonia because I think it's of interest to many of the audience in the Dysphonia International. Uh, perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, it's no longer an issue of whether the voice is too um, strained or uh, tight, but is actually somewhat of a weak voice. And I have no uh, conflict of interest to report for this talk. So the reason why I chose the, this topic is because the, the symptoms that patients present with paresis uh, involves something that we often go to see doctors for, symptoms of cough, a uh, voice that's just not right, sometimes it's affecting swallow, and they often overlap with uh, common conditions that bring the patient to the doctor. And often when these common things, uh, symptoms don't resolve, for example, COVID. I mean, think about how many people, that, I mean, today alone I saw three patients who had COVID in July and August, and they said they had terrible throat clearing, hoarseness, and they, uh, they're they not getting better, and they're besides themselves. And, and uh, they sometimes present very difficult and challenging dilemmas to the clinician, whether you're a um, generalist or a pulmonologist or an otolaryngologist. And even if you're an otolaryngologist that are used to looking at the throat, having enough of a breadth of understanding of this uh, this fascinating nerve, the vagus nerve, uh, can often uh, bring these patients to different multiple clinicians. And this is somewhat akin to what we used to see and sometimes we still see in the patient that have mild spasmodic dysphonia. And so I thought that would be an opportune topic for me to uh, discuss this with the uh, lay public and uh, share some of my thoughts about this uh, topic. So the, my goals for this topic, for this talk is uh, fairly straightforward for the next 40 minutes. I like to try to review some of the, uh, what we know about innervation of the larynx and why we should think about um, the concept of paralysis versus paresis separately. I'd like to ask you to think about some of the signs and symptoms that might bring this disorder to a clinician and help the clinician to sort of understand perhaps why um, these symptoms are not just, uh, you know, transient problems, but maybe part of a more complica complex syndrome. And uh, also you even need to have some idea about, you know, the differential diagnosis. And lastly, we do have treatment for this condition uh, once it's been accurately diagnosed. Dr. So, Wu? Yes. Dr. Uh -huh. Wu, you are not currently in presentation mode, so the slides are not advancing. Oh, they aren't? No, we're still on your... I'm, I'm advancing, you. interestingly. I, I am advancing. Let me see. Do you see the slide that says thesis for the talk? We do. Um, and it looks like there might be a little black box. I don't know. It may be your, there's, that one's gone and there's one on the bottom. It may be your menu. So it's just covering a little bit of the top of um, the, the, the title, but I think mm -hmm. we're good that's, because that's at least fine. we can see yeah, the whole I'll slide. move it as far la to, the, to the right as possible. Perfect. Thank you so right. much. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about this fascinating vagus nerve, which is called the wandering nerve, right, vagus, and what it can do in the larynx. So here is a, a larynx from Wu-Tang Clan. Clan, maybe I said it wrong. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, I get it on popping, dot. I'm locking your doors, locking my drawers, socking your mouth with a torn stocking. Wrapped around a noggin. I creep in while you parking. Shoot out the lights darken. The area then hopping. Pick up my bigger, bigger, who helped me figure the platin. Dropping the top, splitting the dough, shopping the rotten. Still feels a little graspy. <laughs> He's telling me he has a little bit of veiled voice, but I'm thinking, wow, this is... This is a result of million years of evolution to be able to do rap music with a fiber scope in place. So um, it shows you what incredible evolution can do to uh, produce the dynamic, you know, afferent and efferent system that allows the 
larynx to function in a way that's so unique to the human larynx. And it is complicated. I, I you know, when I read about the neuro innovations, I often fall asleep and uh, I says, gee, I can't keep, keep track of all this stuff and all the new information we're learning. And how do you integrate that into a clinical practice day to day? Suffice it to say that, you know, laryngeal innervation is, there's a cortical component, which is where the brain uh, sends, coordinates its uh, signals. Then it goes through the basal ganglia and the thalamus which is the coordination centers for the signals. And then all of that signal is then sorted out and then is uh, placed through the uh, lower motor neurons. So we divide the system of the motor neurons to the uh, larynx into what's called the upper motor neuron, which is cortic cortex, and then lower motor neuron, which is the brainstem. And then the brainstem is then the uh, centers that then send out. And in the brainstem, there are respiratory centers, there are um, uh, swallow centers, and then there are uh, various other uh, coordination centers that is in this brainstem. And here you see nucleus ambiguous. And then through the coordination in the brainstem, then you have the nerves going out and then they exit the skull base and then that's when it becomes the wandering nerve and then the nerve that we're most interested in is called the vagus nerve so the vagus nerve is called uh, the wandering nerve because it is uh, in the uh, it wanders into the chest on the left side wraps around the aorta and then comes back into the larynx and so um, it gives off many, many uh, branches, including the esophagus, the trachea. It gives off uh, 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 innervation to uh, both sensory as well as motor innervation and uh, even uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic, okay? So you can have injury to the, um, to the upper motor neuron that can present as weakness of the voice. And you can have injury to the motor, motor neuron, which can present with um, weakness. So in general, we when we say patients have a vocal cord paralysis, we refer to a flaccid paralysis. Flaccid paralysis is when the nerve in the motor neuron, motor neuron has been injured, so it can't send out the signal anymore. And you have a certain number of um, um, motor neurons in the lower um, uh, uh, motor neuron uh, nucleus because the this area is actually quite small. But you can have um, injuries that uh, has to do with coordination component, and that's why. A lot of people believe that spasmodic dysmonia is a um, uh, not an injury of the is more of a coordination center such as the substantia nigra or the um, uh, intervening uh, agents. So when you look at this specific brainstem morphology, uh, what we know is that the embryologic, not embryologically, but evolution-wise. The nerve to the larynx really started out as a sphincter, and it started out as a sphincter because when man, uh, when when the, I guess the lungfish first evolved out of the water, they needed to have a way to prevent the water from flooding the the airway, so it served primarily as a sphincter, an adductor sphincter, to try to keep water from flooding the lungs. And so in many ways, the lung itself is, the, the larynx itself is just a, a, an adductor sphincter. And to this day, the number of motor neurons that goes to the adductors, which is the closing forces, is greater than the abductors. I like to think that that's probably why the adductor spasmodic dysphonia is more common than the abductor, because the ratio of uh, nerves going to the adductor is about uh, uh, four to one.
okay? But what's interesting is as the human evolved, they also needed a way for the larynx to open up greatly as a survival strategy, perhaps, to allow air to come in. So, for example, when you're really running for your life from a Siberian tiger or something like that, you want to be able to open up your airway as much as you can to get the maximal air. And, um, if, and so those are what we call the abductor muscles. And in fact, uh, Dr. Gasick in his study of uh, brainstem histology has shown that these nuclei are actually separate in the brainstem. So you have a congregation of adductor motor neurons and adductor motor neuron, and they're actually separated by um, a, a fair distance in the brainstem. Okay. So, but uh, when they exit, those nerves are all mixed up. So when you have the nerves in the chest and you have nerves in the, as be, until uh, they're, they're, they're both, there's some nerves go to close the vocal cord, some nerves goes to open the vocal cord, but they're all mixed up until you get to the larynx itself. And then they separate into what's called the adductor branches and the abductor branches, okay? So it's, it's pretty fascinating how, how nature has been able to take a nerve you know, which has two different nuclei, mix it up as it goes through the chest, and then to get separated again only when um, when it separates into the muscles. All right, and um, this is just uh, showing that these uh, the histology stains uh, correlate with that. And not only that, but what we used to think about, you know, some nerves goes to one vocal cord that opens the vocal folds, and one nerve that goes to the vocal cord that closes the vocal fold. It's not always so because they have, it's been mapped out that some of these nerves talk to each other and they're called communicating nerves. And that's done by these uh, stains showing what's called that, if you trace these nerves out, and this is by Dr. Sanders showing that sometimes these nerves, one, what we thought was one nerve going to only the adductors can actually go to both muscles. So what, what we used to believe that you could cut one nerve uh, and uh, um, unlike the nerve to say your leg or something like that, very often the nerve to the larynx will re-sprout and it won't be dead. And that's where a lot of the new interest in being able to take a nerve that's been cut and re it has come from in the last 30, 40 years. Okay, so, um, so these are some of the new observations that says that, boy, you know, maybe what we used to think about where there's only one nerve that opens the vocal cord, one nerve that closes the vocal cord, it's a little bit more complicated. And why is that important? That's important because very often we will see injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the patient will come in with vocal cord that's paralyzed, say after thyroid surgery or carotid artery surgery or esophageal surgery, but then their voice uh, will actually improve or change over time. Or conversely, sometimes they will start out with no breathing problems. And then six months later, they're coming in and says, gee, I'm having breathing problems. And the question is often, well, why? And sometimes um, it can be answered by these histologic studies that shows that, for example, here's a cricothyroid muscle, and it has many different bellies that sometimes communicate with other branches. Um, the, what's called the communication nerve. Sometimes they have um, uh, nerves that might uh, receive parasympathetic and a sympathetic innervation. So, um, and because it's such a long nerve, it gives extensive distribution to look at this, pharynx, palate, trachea, bronchi, lungs, heart, gut. And if you stimulate the vagus nerve to the gut, you're gonna get nausea and vomiting. If you stimulate the vagus nerve to the trachea, you're going to get cough. If you stimulate the um, uh, um, or lo loss of uh, innervation to the pharynx, you're going to have swallow problems. So these are very common problems that we deal with in otolaryngology. Okay, and nerve injury and repair is not just one time thing. Nerve injury and repair can be different. So here's an example of how a nerve can be injured. Um, this is a simplistic injury, in which you, when you cut the nerve, the nerve will die back, and then, but other nerves will try to take over 
what's called its motor unit territory. So it's a little bit like you have um, you have sunshine in a forest, and that sunshine in the forest is then the uh, impetus for new nerves to grow. And so sometimes that's called neurotropic growth factor. And uh, any kind of uh, muscle that's no longer has a governor by a nerve will want to have a new governor. So even though the nerve in the neighboring nerve could be dead, the muscle that no longer has a nerve will be crying out for a new nerve. So then it'll, a neighboring nerve that's still intact will then try to take over its its position. And that's where you get the concept of denervation, which is the loss of nerve going to a muscle, followed by reinnervation, which is the nerve coming back. And But when the nerve comes back, it may not be 100%. So I often tell my patients that have vocal cord paralysis that when we see that, well, it's only a partial nerve regeneration, but it's not complete. It's a little bit like you had a forest fire, only a few trees survived. But then those few trees that survived can grow bigger and they can still take over the forest canopy. So that's one of the reasons why if you had a nerve injury, sometimes we'll say, please wait a year, sometimes even up to 18 months to see if the nerve you know, itself will grow back and repair itself rather than using an adynamic or an invasive procedure to try to restore function. So besides the, the motor function, which is the movement function, which can give you a very weak voice or may uh, result in breathing problems, the nerve to the larynx is also a sensory in a system. And so it's a responsible for things like cough, throat pain, globus, laryngeal spasm. So if you have an uncontrollable cough that's very spastic, we start to think that this could be something called neurogenic cough, which may be due to nerve injury and not just due to acid reflux or, post or allergies or other things like that. So we have to think about both the sensory component and the motor component that comes into it, okay? So to study this, we use uh, uh, nerve uh, studies, uh, and this is often done in a spasmodic dysphonia uh, treatment by using an EMG electrode to stick into the muscle and give you Botox, but we use it as an investigation into nerve injury. And the, the ability to test that gives us a glimpse on nerve function. What nerve is injury, the state of the nerve dysfunction, whether the nerve is coming back or if it's a high grade or low grade nerve injury. And it's not important to, to know about all these different types, but um, there is a condition that is important and that is called synkinesis. So synkinesis is when the nerve, the purpose of the nerve has been disrupted by re that's not purposeful. So if you have a nerve that is supposed to close the vocal cord, but now the nerve has come back, but it's from a nerve that opens the vocal fold, then you could have very breathy voice. On the other hand, if you have a nerve that's going to the um, vocal, vocal cord closing muscles, but it's from a um, muscle that, that closes the vocal cords, then when you go and run, you and that nerve is firing, then you're going to be short of breath. And so we call that paradoxical re -innervation. And that becomes important in, in our ability to treat the problems. Okay, so here's an example. Buttercup, buttercup, buttercup. Buttercup, buttercup, buttercup. Say PT key, PT key. PT key, PT key. Good. Now say he 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 he. He 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 he. Say he 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 he. He 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 he. Now go high. He up there. He. Good. Stop the recording. He. Breath in. He up there. Big breath. Okay, so what you see here is a person that has a little bit of articulation issues, right? She saw us talking through her nose, so she's a little bit hypernasal. 
you can see the vocal fold move, but they're not quite symmetric. So you wouldn't say this person has vocal cord that's paralyzed. He has a sort of a weak voice with both dysarthria and dysphonia. So this is an example of what's called an upper motor neuron deficit. And uh, this person has early ALS, that is amyotrophic lateral um, uh, sclerosis or Lou Gehrig disease, okay? Um, they can present as mild vocal fold phoresis, but that's what it is, all right? So they have supranuclear palsy, and uh, that's the uh, in, important component. They can look like phoresis, but they're not. They have a super, um, uh, supranuclear uh, prosthesis. On the other hand, this is a young woman uh, with sudden onset, presents with sudden cough, sudden coughing spasms that just can't be reconciled, Throat pain started about a month later. Multiple doctors have seen her. She says, well, you have reflux, you have cough. Medication for asthma has not been helpful. <laughs> so here's her, her exam. Good breath in. Doing good. So we're trying to use something called a fatigue, trying to fatigue the system. Now do a pitch glide. So you can see that the pharynx doesn't work 100%. This is a little bit closed. And if you play it again, you can see that this side moves better than this side. That is, the left patient's left side works faster than the right. Okay, here it is, there. Now try this now. So we would say that there is subtle evidence of vocal fold paresis, weakness on one vocal fold and it is translated also to pharyngeal paresis because the pharynx also is not able to work. So um, so we believe that the reason she was having so much pain is she's having the sensory component, sort of almost like neuropathic pain. And we started on a drug called gabapentin and she got better. And uh, um, so the differential diagnosis for a patient with sudden onset of vocal fold paresis can be um, viral induced neuropathy. For example, during COVID, we have seen sudden onset of vocal fold paresis and we reported it of cranial neuropathy. But uh, another virus that can do that is herpes simplex, uh, Lyme disease. Sometimes sarcoid is an autoimmune cause for vocal fold paresis, diphtheria, etc. Okay, so uh, it doesn't always have to look like paralysis. So the things that we look for would be, okay, is the vocal fold motion symmetric? Okay, is there uh, one vocal fold that's shorter than the other? Is it thinner than the other? Does the vocal, for example, in this picture, see how one side is, at, there's an axis shift to the left side? Does the movement jive? Are they symmetric in movement? Is there one side that isn't having the same motion, whether it's an abduction, the degree of opening of the vocal fold, or is there a limited closing to the midline of the vocal fold? And by endoscopic view, we can say, well, gee, there's vocal fold motion asymmetry or configuration changes that would suggest this diagnosis where paresis and not paralysis is present, okay? And then you can even use more advanced studies such as stroboscopy to look at the vibration. And that will show itself as not the normal ability to close the vocal fold. And then the fine details such as the mucosal wave being not normal. All right, so we're gonna go um, with that as a summary. I'm gonna quickly move to how we diagnose and manage vocal fold paresis and how it can separate be separated from the other component that often is is confused with paresis, and that's presbyphonia or age-related vocal fold bowing. So paresis is thought to be a condition of weakness, and you could say it could be a weakness of movement. So if you had somebody that's been in the ICU for uh, 10 days and they come out of the hospital and they're very deconditioned, you could say, yes, you have weakness. But we prefer to use the concept of paresis as a lack of neural function, not just generalized weakness. Okay, so um, the so that that's the that's the term 
working model that we have. So we'd like to talk about motor weakness or partial paralysis related to neuropathy or nerve weakness, okay? So we say it can cause partial movement abnormalities and that it's actually pretty common. If you do a survey of laryngologists, uh, is this article by uh, Wu Solika in 2015, it's, uh, it should be, it's diagnosed by uh, laryngologists you know, eight, 10 times a month. And uh, I would agree with that. But if you asked a general laryngologist, because often they're not trained to look for it, they would say, gee, I hardly ever see it. And also we now recognize this condition called neurogenic cough. And neurogenic cough is no longer just chronic cough, which is often thought to be due to reflux or due to um, post-nasal drip or asthma. We believe there's a separate neurally mediated and whether you want to use the pulmonary definition, which is usually hypersensitivity cough, or sometimes we like to just limit the neurogenic cough to a neuropathic cough, uh, whether it's a sensory component or due to combined motor and sensory neuropathy. So, um, the, this is a typical scenario, 71-year-old female with cough that was recently made worse by upper respiratory infection. She coughs in restaurants and socially is incapacitated. Often these patients have seen many, many physicians. They have been tried on steroid taper, PPI sprays, short narcotics seems to help, steroid inhalers um, may or may not help. And Two, three, four, five. And you can hear the voice is a little bit husky. Keep it up. Take a breath. Oh, he, 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 he. <laughs> Say, he, 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 he. <laughs> the key diff thing that's really interesting is that she's now having exacerbations so that she's now having coughing spasms that's associated with voice disturbance, okay? Say, e and you hear this sniffing. voice, like this vocal fry quality, e uh, almost like a, almost like a pressed, a very pressed phonation, all right? And endoscopically, if you don't stress them, you'll miss them. And that's what we're trying to show here. Two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you see a subtle difference in motion. So, Yes, many people will say, yeah, there's mild reflux changes, but what we can see is that there's reduced abduction and that there's some subtle changes. And when we treat this patient with a neurotropic agent, and we use an older uh, antidepressant called amitriptyline, which is used for sensory neuropathy, she it got rid of it. And uh, she's so happy that uh, she says it's, it's, it's perfect. And so we would taper this medication and uh, six months later, uh, uh, we would try to taper it. We did do a testing on her nerve by putting, subjecting her to EMG testing. And it showed that there is evidence of nerve degeneration. So we believe this is a classic case of where the nerve injury uh, presented as a sensory symptom for uh, an explained uh, neurogenic cough. And uh, what's interesting is that now the chest guidelines include the treatment using both gabapentin as well as some of the neurosensory uh, gabapentin and amitriptyline as well as uh, opioids for treatment of chronic unexplained uh, cough in addition to using speech pathology and so on. All right, so um, with that as an introduction, um, we'll uh, uh, we'll uh, sort of talk about some of the more subtle findings. Why is paresis different than paralysis? Paralysis is usually easy to diagnose because usually, you know, the vocal cord is not moving and it's, sometimes it's, uh, it's associated with severe breathy dysphonia. Uh, and, um, you know, it's used sometimes, a lot of times associated with specific injury events such as intubation or surgery to the neck or spine surgery 
Um, and then we, most otolaryngologists know to do a CAT scan to say, okay, is there a tumor pushing on the nerve and so on. Paresis, on the other hand, is often difficult because the vocal cord is moving. So that we, we were never taught how to grade these things. And so here's an example of paralysis. You see how severe that vocal cord is not moving and there's a huge gap. And here's an example of paresis. Let's try a little whistle. Say about a little laugh. <laughs> okay, so only with rapid motion do you see a huge difference in motion. Okay. And you can see this is a much more severe case than some of the other cases that I showed, right? So what we need in our field is actually a grading system for paresis, much like they have a facial nerve. All right? But if you don't have a good high index of suspicion, your laryngologist, otolaryngologist will not make it. So the, the history is that the voice is not totally bad. It's a veiled voice quality. Almost like, you know, I used to be able to talk uh, with a lot of brightness and, and I'm not tired at the end of the day, but at the end of the day, my voice is shot. I don't have the stamina. I f often find I have to clear my throat. I lost some range in the voice. They're not coming in saying, oh, I can't talk anymore. They're able to talk. Okay, so you need to elicit also the sensory and motor components. Are they coughing and choking? Is there a sense of laryngeal irritability? Is it a sudden onset? And then uh, do they have other swallow issues such as globus, nausea, um, and uh, other things? In the differential, we do have uh, age-related vocal fold bowing or presbyphonia, which is when you... Um, there's a condition that's um, a lot of, um, you know, now it's getting more pressed. It's called sarcopenia, where there's loss of muscle fiber size as you get older. And it seems to affect people starting about age 70. And um, and I've noticed that as I got older, my, the hand, my hand muscles are a little skinnier. Whereas when I was young, being a surgeon, I had very thick, big, beefy muscle, hand muscle. But now it's getting a little skinnier. So the same thing can happen in larynx and you can get, because the larynx size stays the same, the muscle size reduces. So you get this vocal fold bowing. And the, the symptoms are very similar. That is a breathy voice quality, but, they, but it involves both sides. So the fact that one side is different than the other would suggest paresis. Whereas if it's just both sides bowed, then it would support this condition called uh, presbyphonia. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over all the endoscopic features, but, um, you know, if you ask your uh, ENT physicians uh, to help you go through that, uh, they might or may not uh, be offended. Um, so these are all findings that I teach the residents for our paresis course what to look for. All right, suffice it to say the vocal folds should be symmetric. And if they look for position of the vocal fold matching the other, then they'll be able to more likely make that diagnosis. All right. So um, let's move on to what the sensory components are. So we've already talked. So if you ask uh, the, the residents to focus on just these things, it'll be fine. If the vocal cord is shorter, it's thinner, if it's more bowed, and if it has reduced movement, they'll get the diagnosis of paresis right about 85% of the time, okay? Which is good because before they were lagging at, you know, 20, 30%. So, um, so um, yeah, I mean, it's challenging because the more subtle stuff is still a challenge for both the established laryngologists and with um, uh, uh, even people with a lot of clinical experience. So as I said, the differential diagnosis is vocal atrophy versus a vocal fold paresis. Why is that important? It's because vocal fold atrophy is not likely to get better. Vocal fold paresis, if it's a viral neuropathy, often can get better. And it can get better with a combination of voice therapy and even just time. Because remember what I said about re -innervation? The nerve is dying to come back. So it's going to come back over the first 12 to 18 months. So very commonly we'll see, even during COVID, when we were seeing our first 10 patients with vocal fold paresis, and we said, aha, this is worth reporting, we reported it. When we saw those same patients, 10 patients a year later, they vo their voice got better. So we believe this is an acute viral neuropathy for which there is a sensory and motor component. 
And we're still seeing it today. Patients that come in and says, you know, I have a terrible sore throat. I can't seem to get rid of it. My voice isn't quite the same. When am I going to be able to start singing? So very often we say, yes, you have to be patient because sometimes the nerve takes a year to come back. Okay. So that's the, the challenge is that sometimes people just don't want to have the capability for waiting. All right. So um, let's move on to the final uh, component, and that is treatment options. We do have treatment options for patients with vocal atrophy, paresis, and this condition that I call minimal glottic insufficiency. In fact, there's a lot of new stuff now on regenerative medicine that can play a role. And uh, by that, I mean stem cells, growth factors, fillers, and the holy grail of regenerative medicine in laryngology is how to move towards regenerative medicine for um, vocal fold paresis, paralysis, and scar. And the three things that you need are scaffold, growth factor, and stem cells. And uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting research going on, and we're taking a lot of cues from the facial plastic literature, orthopedic literature, as well as um, the wound healing literature to help with this condition. Right now, what we have in our armamentarium is injecting uh, fillers, which is uh, we use fat, Restylane, voice gel, temporary or permanent fillers. Make the vocal cord fatter. Make it fatter so that the vocal folds can close better. And it's very good for small gaps. It can be done in the office. And patients, you know, appreciate that because uh, even during the high holidays now, we've given uh, some uh, temporary fillers to help them get through the high holidays. Sometimes it's just for a couple of weeks. You can use medialization. You can use solid implants for patients with large gaps. You can put a silastic block in there, sort of make the voice box smaller. And by making the voice box smaller, the existing vocal cords can come together better. And much as what has been done for patients with abductor spasmodic dysphonia, by putting an implant or changing the voice box shape, you can make the voice stronger, even though you still have the condition of thin vocal folds um, and uh, we use that when there's larger gaps. But some patients have sensory components. Remember what I said that it's a mixed nerve and you, they can have choking. They have some something called laryngeal spasm and coughing. And we do have some reasonably good drugs that can be used to help. And uh, I can tell you from having a post viral cough for about a month, uh, I couldn't wait to get rid of the cough. And, you know, when you see some of these patients who have been coughing for years, you got to make, you got to have a great uh, uh, sense of empathy for, for what they're going through coughing every night. Okay. So we split the patients with paresis into sensory dominant or motor dominant. For the motor dominant symptoms, we will offer them therapy and then sometimes augmentation. For those who are sensory dominant, we will make the diagnosis and then treat them with uh, neurotropic drugs to try to reduce the sensory irritability. Okay, so um, that's uh, that's that's it in a nutshell. That um, it is complicated. The neurogenic component of cough is very very uh, uh, difficult to you know um, de define. Sometimes it's hyperreflexia, which is the cough. Uh, sometimes it's neurogenic type of cough where there's a sensory in the throat. You don't have pain, you have cough. And so how to uh, carefully manipulate that is very important. This is from Dr. Altman's uh, thesis on uh, cough. And uh, he lists all the different fiber types and uh, type of things that can be activated in terms of uh, understanding it. So I'm not saying that otolaryngologists should be the gateway for cough. Um, because, uh, you know, it is uh, a multidisciplinary issue, but we as otolaryngologists does ha do have a role in understanding and diagnosing uh, this specific entity called a neuropathic cough, okay? So um, the sensory um, drugs that we, uh, sensory component symptom management, we use a, a good amount of pregabalin, nortriptyline, and tramadol, all right? So... For uh, vocal fold incompetence, we try voice therapy, saline injection, hyaluronic acid injection, fat, micronized dermis, or bilateral mutilization. So we have a tiered approach to these problems 
in order to treat um, you know what's a, what's most appropriate depending on let's face it this is depending on patients needs so that what I suggest for somebody who is a practicing lawyer at 85 it might be very different than somebody who is, you know, a, 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 in a nursing home who just wants to be able to communicate. So uh, this is a big summary. Uh, it's a little complicated, and I'm not trying to make clinicians out of you. But we just want to say, okay, new patient, you have to be suspect. You have to suspect the condition to make the diagnosis. And if they're sensory symptomatic, we will certainly consider trial neuromodulators and then um, medical treatment. If they are symptomatic in terms of voice, we offer them office-based wrestling gel and voice therapy. And then if that's not better, we go to fat. In patients that have symptomatic airway symptoms, and that's rare, uh, sometimes we will use Botox to calm the adductors down. Remember what I said, it's, all, it's always the adductors that's acting as sphincter if they can't breathe because there's um, uh, innervation issues. But if they are rather asymptomatic, we will offer them a reassurance voice therapy and uh, take it from there. So I've done a pretty fast run through for this condition that's uh, fascinating to me. And uh, look, let's face it, 20 years ago, I did not know there was such a thing as vocal paresis. I only knew that there was vocal cord paralysis and then re -innervation. But so now we have a more nuanced view. And uh, I still see a lot of patients with paresis that's, that's missed. And um, my hope is that by bringing this to awareness for both lay public, as well as you know in talks, uh, different places, um, I can bring this as a discussion so that um, patients will not have to go through multiple physicians in order to come to a uh, uh, logical conclusion. And I can tell you, uh, being able to take a patient with neuropathic cough who has been coughing for five years and being able to give them a medication for a month and have them come back and says, you've changed my life is very, very rewarding. And uh, taking a patient who has been to many different physicians who says, you know, I don't quite sound the same and everybody tells me I'm okay. And then giving them a, an injectable material that allows them to go on book tours and, uh, and doing other things. It's, it's very rewarding and it's probably one of the reasons I keep doing uh, what I'm doing. So uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention uh, on this topic. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Fantastic uh, and very uh, interesting uh, presentation, uh, very enlightening. So thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your experience and expertise uh, with all of us. So we do have um, a little bit of time for questions. So let me... Uh, yes. Uh, if I can get to, uh, to the questions here. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, um, there's a question uh, that uh, is asking, how is uh, uh, a laryngeal reflux related to voice disorders? So uh, how much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> the, the short version. All right. So you know, the laryngeal reflux blasted into the public consciousness 1994. You know, we always recognized there was something called reflux. And you, if you read the old literature, oh, you know, Moral McKenzie, um, 1850s, um, disease of the throat, they used to call it a gin and midnight voice. All right, gin and midnight voice. Because people would take gin and they would reflux all night and then, you know, they would sound like they had a really croaky voice in the morning. And then they would be called chronic nonspecific laryngitis. All right. And we still believe that there is a component of that today. But when Jamie Kaufman published his, her thesis on uh, acid reflux, sort of made the laryngology world aware that 
you know, the larynx is basically just like the Lincoln Tunnel or Times Square of the um, of the airway. So anything that comes goes down can come up. So therefore, acid reflux became the the darling diagnosis for laryngologists worldwide. So I would say from 1994 through 2014, we gave PPI. Everybody that had laryngitis uh, was diagnosed to have reflux. Everybody. We gave uh, twice a day PPIs to more or less everybody who says, look, you have reflux, you need to be on medication. And even, um, you know, some of the real, and the studies that looked at how much acid came up to the throat uh, was controversial. You know, there were some studies that says even one event to the throat was considered pathologic. And then there's some study from uh, Holland that says, oh, you can have up to eight events up to the throat. Well, that's an eightfold difference. Well, maybe because they drink more beer in than, uh, in Holland, so that's why they have more <laughs> reflux. So suffice to say, it continues to be very uh, challenging to make a good diagnosis of reflux. I think most people can make a good diagnosis of reflux if you see the chronic beefy throat of what's called posterior laryngitis. But the more subtle stuff of grading, you know, whether the laryngeal the mucosal wave is abnormal or if that uh, the red throat is due to this or the mucus is due to reflux, that's hard. It's hard to make a, diff because um, other causes for laryngeal inflammation and edema exist, right? We just came through hay fever season in New York. We're still in the middle of it post-nasal drip and and uh, this puffy blue color to vocal fold that makes the vocal cords swollen. Singers can't sing. Uh, and it coincides right with the high holiday, Jewish high holidays in, in the New York area. It's horrible. Uh, you know, God did not design the high holidays at a good time compared to allergy season. So, so these are all uh, things that still is controversial. Suffice it to say that with the recent understanding of long-term um, side effects of long-term PPI use, we're trying to cut back some and have a more nuanced view and we'll almost re rejuvenate the older concept of chronic nonspecific laryngitis. So that it's true that many multifactorial components can cause laryngeal edema and therefore affect voice and i'll leave it at that good thank you sir for uh i i know it's a very complex topic so thank you dr Wu, for a good explanation um a, qu a question here that's uh does unilateral paresis cause soft palate weakness or breathing coordination issues okay so the question is, does unilateral vocal fold paresis, can it cause soft palate weakness? Right. So, so the nerve, the vagus nerve uh, is a very long nerve. And if the nerve is injured high, for example, if it's in, injured in the trunk of the vagus before the nerve to the palate is given, then the voice will have a hypernasal quality. So they'll wind up talking a little bit like this. Does that make sense? So when you look at them, their palate will not be working so well. And so, but unfortunately, some other diseases can mimic that. So for example, myasthenia gravis is a classic example where you have, um, it's, it's a muscle disease. The muscle fatigues and can't contract. So they can wind up talking sort of like through the nose like this also. And you look at the vocal cords, it's not weak on one side, it's weak on both sides. All right. So, um, so I hesitate to say, so the short answer is yes. If it's a, if it's a high vagal injury, we specifically look to see if palate is weak. And if the nerve, if the palate is out, we demand that a, a good radiographic imaging be done through the skull base. Because you can get problems like meningioma, you can get uh, neurosarcoidosis, any of a number of autoimmune diseases, um, aseptic meningitis, they can all cause 
problems like that. All right. Rare, but, yeah. but real. Uh, yeah. And, and also in addition to that, Dr. Wu, uh, can, can a unilateral paresis also cause uh, breathing coordination issues? Um, so, yeah, you know, so the, it can cause breathing coordination issues in one of two ways. The, the, uh, the one pathway is a sensory component. Okay. So if you had, um, uh, a severe coughing spasm, you can activate the vagal reflexes and you can vomit, you can black out. And we've had uh, cough related syncope as a diagnosis for a while. And uh, so, so very often coughing spasms due to sensory hypersensitivity will bring a patient to the emergency room. I had a coughing spasm. I couldn't breathe. Okay. So that's an example of a sensory mechanism. The other mechanism is much rarer, much, much rarer. So for example, that is on a motor basis. And the motor basis would be what I talked about in terms of paradoxical re -innervation. So to say the nerve to the uh, somebody who had a thyroid surgery and they were very, uh, their voice was terrible for the first three months, but then the voice got better. But then all of a sudden there's, they're in the doctor's office uh, six months later says, you know, doctor, well, I, I, I used to be able to uh, get up and, uh, you know, walk up the stairs very briskly. But now every time I do any kind of exercise, I'm huffing and puffing. But my voice is better. And my doctor says, I'm fine. And you look at them and sure enough, the vocal cord that's paralyzed when you ask them to take a deep breath, instead of the vocal cord opening like they're supposed to, they're actually coming inward. The paralyzed side is coming inward, okay? And you put a needle into the muscle and you say, oh my goodness, the nerve, to the, the muscle, which is the adductor muscle, the TA muscle, is actually firing during deep inspiration. So that's an example of paradoxical re -innervation. The nerve has come back, but the, the motor unit territory got occupied by motor neurons from the breathing center. So instead of opening the vocal cord, it's closing the vocal cord. So the solution for that is either re -innervation. You can take, cut the nerve and put another nerve to babysit it. You can use Botox, which is a non-spasmodic dysphonia use of Botox to paralyze the vocal cord, the adductor function, so you can breathe better. And uh, I can tell you, I have several patients that I still manage that way and they don't want to go for surgery. They just want to have the Botox every three to six months. And it's a good option for them for unilateral. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let's wrap up with, uh, with this uh, question or uh, kind of uh, uh, something that comes up in, in our spasmodic dysphonia community uh, from time to time. And that is, do you see cases where people have spasmodic dysphonia and that progresses into vocal fold paralysis or paresis? Um, so can I see, do I see spasmodic, dys can spasmodic dysphonia coexist with paresis? Yes, but they don't progress. Okay. So if you think, if you take the model that spasmodic dysphonia is a movement disorder, it remains a movement disorder. There's a coordination component for which, uh, yes, you have uh, surgery to, you know, uh, denervation, re procedures, there's uh, Botox and so on and so forth. But ultimately, the, 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 the problem is still as, uh, as, shown by Smulian, I believe, uh, from, um, from uh, Mass General, it's a, sometimes it's a central coordination, uh, you know, center uh, disorder. So if you think of paralysis paresis, it's a peripheral nerve injury. So the two don't mix. So I would say, yes, you can use surgery such as vo the inducing vocal cord paralysis to treat the symptoms of, uh, of spasmodic dysphonia. 
but one does not progress to the other. Okay, good, excellent. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, again, uh, we appreciate uh, you sharing your time uh, with us today and, uh, and your expertise and vast knowledge in the, in the area of laryngology. And, and most important, Dr. Wu, I, I want to speak uh, for myself and on behalf of the whole voice community. Your contributions to laryngology have just been tremendous, and we cannot thank you enough, sir. Oh, you're very, very kind, and it's a pleasure to see all these uh, uh, chat and questions, uh, you know, coming at me, which is wonderful. So, right. so right. thank you. Yes, sir. And I, <clears throat> to all the participants, uh, uh, just a couple of points I want to make, and we'll wrap up. But uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, we will work with Dr. Wu to get answers to um, a lot of the questions that we did not have time to get to. Uh, yeah, I can time. I can stay by and uh, and just uh, answer some of these Q and A on the on the Q and A section. I can click on okay. it and just type in some okay. of the answers if you want. Yeah, uh, would that help that you? Or, or we can uh, we'll we'll uh, get back with you after the webinar or tomorrow, whatever. And, and what we'd like to do is probably record some answers uh, mm -hmm. so we can make it part of the webinar. If sure, that's, sure. If you yeah, whatever, is, whatever is your pleasure. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Super. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, the other uh, uh, question or the other uh, comment I want to make to all the participants is is a reminder uh, uh, for everyone in uh, in our voice community, patient voice community, that our third annual Walk for Talk will be October 20 through 23. And we have had uh, fantastic participation over the past couple of years from people all around the country. And it can be a virtual uh, event. Uh, no matter what, you can walk, you can swim, you can run, you can bicycle, whatever would work for you and, um, and your friends, colleagues, family members or whatever. So uh, we would encourage you to participate. Uh, this is a way that we work to increase awareness of voice um, issues, not only spasmodic dysphonia, but a lot of other voice issues as, as Dr. Wu has been talking about in this webinar. So uh, participate uh, in any way that works for you and help us to raise that awareness and help us to raise funds to uh, fund and encourage research. And uh, some of the encouraging research that Dr. Wu touched on and, and mentioned during this webinar um, is, is really fantastic and it is truly exciting. But that kind of work uh, takes a lot of money uh, to do. So we need your help and support and, uh, and every dollar is important. So uh, we appreciate all of you attending the, uh, the webinar and uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar uh, probably later uh, next month. So again, Dr. Wu, thank you so much, sir. And I uh, will we'll hopefully see you next week in San Francisco. Right. You know, there's a meeting called the phonosurgery meeting in Kyoto. So I'm scheduled uh, <laughs> a little so further out. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Got it. Safe travels. Sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank, uh, thank everyone for participating. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.